Hi guys and welcome back. I am Red Zed and I am joined by a very special guest today. Yottle from the mod team, the main historian who's done all this work on the Illyrians. Welcome to the channel. Hello, thanks for having me. No problem. Thank you very much for joining us. And today we're going to be going over all the histories, all the historical notes on these Illyrian factions in much greater detail than I could give you in the uh, the last video. And of course, I took all of that information from Yottle's uh, dev diary anyway. So uh, he is the expert. So this is going to be awesome. We're going through all of these Illyrian factions and their history like we did with the Greek factions as well so looking forward to this yossel yeah me too yeah fantastic well we're going to start with the illyrian kingdom who are down here in the south obviously bordered by epirus and the antigonids and the del the delmate i believe as well in the north no the labate labateans uh, as well yeah um so these guys it seemed at least from the developer diary that they were pretty influential i've got to say in the region the Lurian Kingdom, yeah. Um, I'm, I was most excited for them because uh, they're a little bit of an amalgam faction, um, I would say, um, because we don't really know where they are, what they exactly are, um, but they're probably somewhat successors of the Torlantians. And like you already said in the video, there were some. Um, Talentian dynasts who um yeah they're um somewhat successors of the Talentians. um they had this famous king called glaucias he was uh a king at the time of alexander the great um he fought with him at pelion pelion is a city in the Dasaretis. you can see it in the east if yeah. you zoom in yeah there's pelion um while Alexander was in the territory of the Tribaloi, um, two okay, kings revolted off. against him. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there are the Tribaloi with the, with the two people on the banner. And yeah. um, while he was there, uh, the Illyrians revolted against the Macedonians. Uh, Philip had previously subdued them. And so Alexander had to rush south to meet them. And there were two kings, uh, Clytos, probably a Dasaretian king. Uh, so in Pelion and in um, the general Dasaretus, uh, around this giant lake that you can see there, um, called Lake Lychnidos. And um, this is a perfect border region against Illyria. Uh, Philip built multiple fortresses there, like uh, Lychnidos and Pelion. And um, so holding these territories was really important for Mac Macedon, because um, they had a very bad experience with Illyrian incursions into Mac <laughs> uh, Macedonia. Um, Phil Philip's father himself had to buy Macedon's freedom, I'd say, and had to give uh, Philip as a hostage to the Illyrians wow. at the time. And they gave him to the Thebes. Um, so yeah, the Illyrians had a lot of say in the politics of Mac Macedon at the time. And um, so the Dasaretis was this border region that was really important to hold. And they were revolting. So Alexander had to rush down there, fight a big battle at Pelion, where he um, defeated both kings. And the Dasaretian king, uh, Clytos, lost his kingdom, but um, Glaucias kept it. And he not only kept his kingdom, he survived Alexander by a long shot. Yeah. So Alexander had this whole campaign in Persia, right? And um, died. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. As it happens. And um, Glauc um, Glaucias was still alive. And so during the War of the Successors, the son of Antipatros, um, the regent in Macedon, he was trying to establish himself in Illyria too, especially because a rival of his in the form of a little child called Pyrrhus, maybe you have heard of him. Yep. <laughs> um, Pyrrhus was hidden in Illyria in the court of this the same Glaucias. And um, so Cassan uh, Cassandros invaded Illyria succeeded but he couldn't hold it because the greeks were against him and they 
um, reconquered both Epidamnos and Apollonia and gave Epidamnos back to Glaucias. Um, which I find really funny. You can see Tolan Tolantia under Cesaretos. Um, the Tolantians were always associated with Epidamnos. And um, this is why we gave the city to the Illyrian Kingdom too. Because um, you can look at, yeah, M Mytilos the uh, Tolantian in Lyssos. Should sit in Lyssos, I think. Yeah. Uh... Um, it's the current king. Yeah, this guy. Um, and he is the successor of a certain Monunius. Mm. And we know of both Monunius and Mytilos that they minted coins in Epidamnos. Um, the first coinage of an Illyrian king was of Monunius with his name and um, uh, the, the short term for, for Durachion, the alternative name of Epidamnos. Um, and not only that, we have him in the written sources where in the prologue it is said that he fights against um, uh, Ptolemy Kiraunos. Mm. And we have his helmet found in the Dasaretes, in the tomb, um, where he wow. placed the city of Dasaretopolis. Um, there was a royal tomb of the Illyrians, and there was a helmet found um, with an inscription on the neck, Mununius. So, um, we... So scholarship is pretty sure that the same Ununius is um, the king of Illyria at the time and ruled over uh, the area of the Talantians and the Patinoi and Epidamnos because that's where he minted his coins and his successor still minted his coins and the Dasaretos. Um, so they are pretty sizable at the time and they were still very heavily involved in politics in Macedon because Bitidos is also in the written sources next to the coins he minted. Uh, where it is said that he fights uh, Alexander, the heir of Pyrrhus. Mm. Um, so, in, so a couple yeah. of questions then before we move on to their sort of because uh, we're getting towards sort of their downfall now, aren't we? And um, yeah, how they how they definitely. came to uh, lose control of the region. So, obviously, Dasaretopolis, or, or, or what did we call it over here, uh, Dasaretia. So why was that yeah. so important for the Macedonians? And was that just simply because it was a, a well-defended position so that they couldn't, you know, get all the way to Pella, basically, in the rich cities uh, in the north of Greece? Um, or was this region, you know, particularly rich for any reason? Or was it just like, this is just a good region for defense. That's why we're going to try and hold this region and maybe push the Illyrians back from here. No, it was a really good border region, mainly. It was not um, really... Uh, fertile and um, yeah the Macedonian kings often took care um, that their border regions are kind of desolate <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, which um, the later Philip V also did against the Dardanians mm. but uh, yeah the Dasaretes was a kind of poor region but there were like I said many fortresses um, like uh, Pelion scholarship is not 100% sure where all the fortresses are located. They aren't still sure if Pelion is there where we think it is. Yeah. Um, so it's pro probably around the spot where we put it. And um, so this was um, a really good spot to kind of bottleneck Illyrian incursions. And every every time the Dasaretis was held by the Macedonians, Lyria had a rather hard time getting into Macedon. And if the region was insecure, like during the Macedonian Wars against Rome, where Rome immediately went for the Dasaretes, um, it was really easy for the Roman Illyrian allies to get into Macedon and yeah. wreak havoc. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, it's just a really well defensible region and, uh, you know, easy to uh, easy to uh, to watch anyone coming in and stop anyone coming in, basically. Um, that's yeah. cool. You see the little minor Illyrian region above the Dasaretes. There, this one, which yeah. This Kana. Um, this also count, counts a bit into this region. It's also sometimes um, called the Dasaretian uh, uh, region. Yeah. And um, but they appear quite late in the. I think third Macedonian Wars, where Philip, uh, where per Perseus, I think it is, um, 
attacks them to take their fortresses because they also have quite a few in that region. Um, I think Livy says they have 11 fortresses. Yeah. And um, he tries to take them all and Rome and um, Perseus fight over them a lot. So yeah, this, this whole Desertus region from north to south is, is really important for uh, Macedon. Yeah, cool. Awesome. And um, follow-up question, then second question on what's uh, what's been said so far. So why why would Glaucias take in Pyrrhus when Pyrrhus, obviously his family were killed and overthrown? Why would they would they take him in? Would it would, is it simply to you know basically farming influence in Epirus, basically down south, uh, to try and raise someone and, and create an ally there? Or um, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's definitely one of the main reasons. Um, like I said, the Illyrians were really well connected with the Macedonians. And when I say Illyrians in this case, um, I refer to the Illyrians inside the Illyrian kingdom because that's kind of the, what um, most authors meant at the time when they said Illyria. They didn't really count um, like Damasia and um, Histria like we do. Um, so they really meant this region, and um, yeah. after Philip conquered Illyria, he was, um, and even before that, um, they had marriage politics. Um, Philip married an Illyrian um, noble's daughter, and um, like during the wars of the successors, there was an Illyrian princess, um, Oridike. Um, Who, who also tried to claim the throne with um, with um, Alexander's half-brother. Uh, she married him. And so Illyrians also tried to get their hands into the succession of the Macedonian throne. Yeah. Um, so Glaucias also had an interest he, in that. He was not just like a former vassal um, of Philip and Alexander. Um, he also had a claimant in his court with Pyrrhus, who was mm. like a... Um, Oh, I think a second cousin or something of Alexander. Well, and if even if even at the time, even if someone didn't have a claim, if they had a big army, they had a claim, didn't they? So, <laughs> yeah, uh, Pyrrhus was kind of. Um, I mean, um, Alexander's mother, uh, Olympias, um, she was a pirate. Mm. So, um, and the Iaquides, um, they were the at the time the um, rulers of uh, Epirus and um, because the current king of Epirus, uh, Ayakides, was kind of, um, he wasn't liked and um, the family was overthrown and in, in this rage the populace wanted to kill the entire family and so Pyrrhus was rescued and mm. taken to Illyria into, um, um, into exile He was like two years old or something, and um, Plutarch, um, our source who likes to tell stories a little bit exciting, um, <laughs> um, he has um, pearls like crawl, he's still a little baby, crawl on his knees to um, Glaucias and um, take like uh, take like to his knee, which was a gesture of um, of a sub suppliant. Um, yeah. like someone who goes to the temple and begs for um, for mercy or for, for something for the favor of the gods yeah um, so he was kind of first laughing at it and was like oh, this this baby is like a, a suppliant but then he was also um, yeah kind of sad by it and he was hoping to to get Pyrrhus back to his home but also of course get kind of something out of it and um, yeah probably so if, if a, Sorry, last point. If Mununius and Mutilos are successors of Glaucias, it could be that there was another succession crisis in Illyria that Pyrrhus claimed Illyria because he was brought up in the court of, um, um, of Glaucias. And um, he also married an Illyrian princess. Um, And there is Mononius and Mytilos, who yeah. are also rulers of Illyria, so that's why there might have been a war between the son of Pyrrhus and the son of um, Mononius. Mm. Cool. Um, and finally, just one quick 
quick thing as well about Glaukias. Obviously, mentioned in the developer diaries that he he ruled for at least thirty years. You know, thirty years after Alexander's death. So, I'm assuming <laughs> what forty years, maybe fifty years at max, I guess, that he I ruled think for from three hundred forty to around three hundred. Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, yeah. At the time, we don't know when he died. So about um, thirty-five years, at, at least. Yeah. Like Th thirty-two, thirty-two, forty years is a good um, rule of thumb for him, I, I think. And yeah. how rare was that at the time? Because I'm assuming, with the amount of backstabbing <laughs> and wars going on, that that was during, extremely rare. During the wars of the successors, um, that was quite long, I guess. Um, a few of them got relatively old. Yeah. Um, I mean, like the the final battle because before it went down in Macedon with the Celtic invasion was um, the battle between um, Lysimachos and uh, Seleukos, who were both almost eighty at the time, I think. Yeah. And um, not even mentioning Ptolemy, who was just chilling in Egypt, um, basically unobstructed. So yeah. um, I, I guess people could get relatively old, but um, but they're quite quite in, in that in, in that area you didn't really rule that long, I think. Yeah, well before 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 something happened, <laughs> some accident, hunting accident, basically. Oh no, he was hunting and someone accidentally shot him through the head with a javelin. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, yeah, it was an That's accident. <laughs> um, quite practically, um, Pyrrhus dies in Argos yeah um, because he got hit by a brick yep um, but right before that um, there is a soldier he fights against who um, sees him and um, as soon as Pyrrhus is hit by the brick uh, he takes out an Illyrian knife and tries to cut Pyrrhus's head off yeah um, and then uh, he succeeds I guess because he brings the head um, or the son of Antigonus brings the mm. head to, to Antigonus after the battle and he's really shocked to see the head of his rival and is really outraged. <laughs> he has to cry, uh, to to just cut the head of a of a king. Yep. Um so yeah. Out um, of all the ways for Pyrrhus to die as well. That's uh with with an Illyrian knife. I yeah. guess he died because of the brick, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> Well, we don't know, we don't know. It, it could have been it could have been the knife, but you never know, dear. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, cool. Sorry, I, I, I just thought those questions were quite pertinent to uh, to the well, Illyrian <laughs> kingdom. So, um, um, I guess we were at the point where they were attacking Macedon, right? Um, yeah, the Illyrian kingdom, as we have it now, which is kind of the, the successor kingdom of either the Tolentians or the Dasaritians. Um, we, we can't really be hundred percent sure. Um, they end up falling somewhere around 240 BC under the rulership of the Ardii um, and King Agron and um, Queen Teuta. And um, we don't really know how that happens, we just know um, when we get our sources back into this area because we have a re real scarcity of sources. Mm. Um, suddenly, um, Toyota tries to conquer Epidamnos. Um, so, and it's in Greek hands because, and uh, I think there's also an attack on Apollonia because the Apollonians, uh, Apolloniats, Apolloniots, call in the Romans for help. Um, so, whatever happens in like these 30 years is not entirely clear. Um, and what happens to to the Illyrian kings? Maybe they lose against Alexander of Epirus. Um, maybe they they get destroyed in infighting. Yeah. And um, we can say with um, Agron, the the Ardian king, he gets he becomes a new king of Illyria. Um, this is a title that is of course applied by by the Romans and Greeks. Um, we don't really care a hundred percent which Illyrian rules now. <laughs> yeah, it's all Illyrian to them, and they all call each um, uh, themselves um, Illyrian kings, I guess. And um, so these territories, Lysos, um, 
the Talantians, probably also the Patinoi, um, they fall under Ardian rule. And it's the Romans that, um, yeah, that liberate them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you first get, I think, the Patinoi who, um, who are in the south next to Apollonia um, in, in Dimale. They are the first ones to go over to the Romans and are like, please help us against the Adiai and, um, or I guess against the Illyrian kingdom and then um, others follow. Um, even the Adiai themselves, funnily enough, after the Romans beat Teuta, um, they liberate the Adiai from the, from the Illyrian kingdom. Um, but it's still the Adiaian kingdom of the Illyrians. Um, <laughs> Because a later source tells us that that Agron was a um, was an Ardian ruler. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, nice. Interesting. Really interesting. So, in terms of their um, their units, then uh, I think they've got the standard Southern uh, Southern Illyrian roster, haven't they? Um, do they yeah. have any? I don't believe they have any sort of uh, unique units as the Illyrian Kingdom. They just have the Southern. But, but guys, there are new units coming as well. So these are not all the units, by the way. And just so you know, when we have a look at some of these units, the stats haven't been fully finished yet. So when we have a look at them, don't get too excited over the stats. They're all going to be done uh, as well as the, um, you know, all of the rosters getting a couple of extra units. Not all of the rosters, but in terms of the whole uh, Illyrian sort of rosters getting a few more units as well. So, um... Uh, that's cool, but I don't think they have any sort of specific AOR-ish unit, really, do they? Just the standard Southern Illyrian roster. Yeah, I guess the Illyrian Kingdom has the advantage of getting more Greek AOR in Epidamnos and Apollonia yeah. when they conquer it. Um, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so that's an advantage in this, um, in this special regard. Um, other than that, they have the standard uh, Southern Illyrian roster. It's a bit... Um, of course, inspired by this famous belt plate that everyone puts in their papers and books when they talk about the Illyrians. <laughs> um, you know exactly which one I mean. It's it's a, literally their faction symbol, and it's also the faction symbol of the RDI in Rome Total War. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's but we can be quite sure that they have hoplite-like units. Mm. Um, the source of um, Ariane, uh, Ariane, who um, tells us the whole Anabasis of Alexander, like the, the Alexander campaign. He also tells us about this Battle of Pelion that I mentioned. And he just outright calls them hoplites. Um, yeah. He says the, the Talentians bring um, a bunch of hoplites, peltas, slingers, and cavalry. And um, yeah, so. Um, and they have pretty. Uh, what you might not expect from like people that are usually called barbarian, um, they have really disciplined formations. Something mm. that the sources, even when they call them barbarians, repeatedly mention in the Hellenistic era is that the Illyrians have really disciplined formations, a bit like maniples of the Romans. Yeah. Um, that are really good aggressively um, at routing enemies. <laughs> And um, really disciplined and um, not um, quite easy to route. So the Romans have their issues against them when they uh, fight them on on Issa. And um, yeah, they they relieve an Arcananian city from an Aetolian siege. Yeah. And um, they, yeah, Polybius describes how their um, let's call it battalions, their maniples. Um, their formations just wander towards the Aetolians and charge them in formation and rout them immediately. <laughs> and um, we have, I think, it's Philip who also sends Illyrian um, mercenaries to Crete, and they are they they do a pretty good job. Um, Antigonus Doson, the um, yeah the grandchild of Antigonus Gonatas, uses uh, Illyrians in. Zelazia against the Spartans to take a hill. Um, so yeah, they are pretty. They are always known as kind of assault units who are very good aggressively, but also very disciplined, um, which oh. you don't really expect from from the Illyrians, since you don't really, since people tend to not really know a lot about them. Yeah, no, that's cool. 
That's really cool. So shall we move on to the Dardanians then? Yeah. So here we are as the Dardanians, one of my favourites from the Dev Diaries in terms of their history. So where do we start with them? Um, yeah, the Dardanians are like one of the harder factions to figure out, which is kind of weird because they are really prominent in the sources. Yeah. Um, but but never in detail. Like you, in in every source you get um, Dardanian raids into Macedonia, and um, it really starts with Philip. Like the name of the Dardanians already appears quite early on in Homer in the in the Trojan Wars, but they are probably not the same Dardanians. Um, they're very likely not the same Dardanians. And um, so really as a people, they first appear as enemies of Philip, um, Philip II of Macedon, after he takes out the Paeonians and the Illyrians and the Thracians. So after he takes out Paeonia, he suddenly neighbors the Dardanians. And it's the sources are not really, don't really agree on that. Um, some say he attacked them without provocation, some say they endanger Macedon. Um, they are, at the very least, um, somewhat Illyrian, but also a lot, um, very much their own thing. Um, the sources rarely call them just Illyrians, um, mm. a mistake scholarship has often done in the past, that um, they, for example, often assume that um, that Mununius, um, we just talked about, is a Dardanian king. Yeah. Um, because later on there is an actual Dardanian king called Mununius, and they think it's um, um, it's just a Dardanian name, but it's just an Illyrian name, and the Dardanians take on Illyrian names for for their own royalty. Um, but they are very much their own thing. They um, sit like, as you see, um, to the north of um, the Paeonians. Um, we have lots of hill forts in what is assumed that um, to be their territory, and um, later on more cities in the valleys. Like um, you see that they have a lot of mountainous and hilly regions yeah. where they first have their forts and then they come down to the um, valleys, which is probably a sign that they start to unite more. Um, so fast forward, Philip, um, Philip defeats them, he subdues them, but he doesn't really conquer them because that's not really an area he cares about. I think he just <laughs> wanted to show them that they don't, that they shouldn't mess with him. Yeah. And they don't, they don't um, mess with Alexander either. either. Um, even when he goes for the Triballoi in the north, um, there was sometimes the assumption that he had to go um, through Dardania, but he didn't. Um, there was. Uh, during an era where no one was quite sure where all the peoples are, like where are the Tribaloi, where are the Skodiskoi, where are the Dadanoi. Um, so yeah, they, they keep a low profile, as you also said in your video. And um, they really start bothering the Macedonians um, when the sources focus again on them um, in the later 3rd century BC with Philip V, which I, yeah. uh, who I previously mentioned. And um, they constantly start raiding Macedon. Like every time the army is away, they have an army in the in, in the <laughs> fields of Macedon. Um, oh, oh, I guess it starts out somewhat earlier um, because we get this Celtic invasion. Um, I don't know if it has been mentioned before. This great Celtic invasion of Delphi in um, 280 BC. Um, it's for, for the Greeks. It's a real catastrophe. Um, like there is this huge Gallic host of of these these bearded um, stereo, uh, stereotypes, of course, of these bearded guys who just enter Greece and want to pillage everything. Um, and um, of course, the Celts were somewhat known before, but um, the Greeks were really afraid of them. And um, it was a really bad timing for the Greeks because Macedon was in the middle of a civil war with Ptolemy Keraunos, who I previously mentioned. Um, because now, now it gets complicated. <laughs> you have this battle that I mentioned with Lysimachos and Seleucus who fight each other. Yeah. Lysimachos at the time is the king of 
Macedon and Thrace and Seleucus of the Seleucid Empire. Yeah. Um, they both are nearly 80 years old. Um, Seleucus beats Lysimachos, he dies, and then he is like, okay, I'm the true heir of Alexander now, I can enter my kingdom, and he crosses over into Europe, into his new Macedonian, Thracian, Seleucid Empire, and he gets killed by Ptolemy Kiraunos, yeah. who is in his retinue. Um, who gets the name Kiraunos, Thunderbolt, because of this action, because he, he acts so aggressively and quickly. Um, so Kiraunos is now the king of Seleucia and Thrace and Macedon, but because of this whole chaos, it's already kind of crumbling around him. Um, and yeah, there is also Pyrrhus, who supports him somewhat, but also doesn't. There's Demetrios and his son Antigonos. And it's a big brawl in Macedon. And <laughs> in the middle of that, the Celts in the lead. Um, maybe they were even on the side of someone in, in this in this whole um, conflict. We don't really know. And um, because of that, because it's such a big threat, um, the Dardanian king comes to Ptolemy Keraunos and is like, okay, here's a deal. I give you 20,000 men and you beat off this Celtic invasion. Um, because, of course, it was also threatening the Thracians, the Paeonians, the Dardanians. And Kiraunus is, no, is like, no, uh, screw you, I can do it on my own. Then he dies. <laughs> <laughs> um, he dies in battle against the Celts, they proceed to Delphi and sack it, and then they get beaten by a Greek alliance. And then a few remnants of the Celts go back through Dardanian territory and the Dardanians finish them off. Um, they probably come out of it relatively unscathed, like Thrace is destroyed, um, Macedon and Greece are, uh, or Central Greece are pretty wrecked by this invasion and Dardania is probably okay-ish, <laughs> yeah. relatively, and um, that's kind of where they enter this, um, enter Greece as a major player and um, start threatening Macedon every time the border gets insecure. They often go through Bilazora, um, which is in Paeonia. Um, this is their path into Macedon. Like, we have the Dasaretes as a border region against Illyria, and Paeonia as a border region against the Dardanians. Um, so, a lot of fighting happens around this region against the Dardanians. When Antigonos Dozon fights against Sparta at Dalasia, which I previously mentioned, um, he is away from Macedon, so the Dardanians invade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which then always happens. So he returns and they flee. Um, and um, the interesting thing about this, about this is um, that they often take a lot of prisoners. Um, and scholars have somewhat compared them to Sparta in a way. Hmm. In that they ba probably base a huge part of the economy off of slaves. Um, I think it is Atinaios who even says that um, there are a thousand slaves per Dardanian. Wow. Which has scholars doubting it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> how do you want to keep so many slaves? Um, what could be more likely is that it's kind of proto-feudal um, mm. in, in the way that it's not slaves but more like um, what do you say? Serfs. Right, yeah. and um, because they get recruited for battle, so um, they get they get indeed armed for campaigns, and um, I think the source even said they get put into companies, so in, into like what I previously mentioned that the Illyrians often have like formations of of infantry, the Dardanians seem to have that too, yeah. um, and we get in a, even in a later episode with Philip. Um, when they invade again <laughs> um, in, in the Second Macedonian War, um, the Romans used the Dardanian um, pillaging to their advantage and just let them roam free in Macedon. And um, Philip splits up, uh, splits up his forces and um, has the Dardanian host followed by cavalry and light infantry. And Livy says that um, they don't have really anything to answer. They are very infantry-based culture, mm. um, a very heavy infantry-based culture. Um, so they 
can't really do anything against um, the light infantry and the cavalry. But they also don't really take a lot of losses. Um, Livy emphasizes that their disciplined formation um, keeps them from, from losing a lot of men. They get a lot of wounded, but not a single man is taken prisoner. Um, because they they are disciplined enough to not break and rout, but they yeah. they probably just take their wounded with them and and hold the formation on their retreat, um, which is kind of pretty impressive. And we gave them um, a nice uh, speculative unit, um, the Dardanian pikemen. I think they're probably somewhat further down the line. Yeah, that's probably after. Oh, no, uh, they're, yeah, they're after reforms. Yeah. Yeah, they are, they're a reform unit. Um, they are probably one of the more uh, speculative units we have for the Illyrians. Um, because the pikemen, um, we have a dedication at the, um, I think it's a sanctuary at Lindos um, from King Philip of Macedon. We don't know which Philip, it's probably Philip V. And a paper also wrote, the inscription is hard to read. It's probably the, the Dardanians, but the other enemy is not really known. Um, mm. It's usually assumed to be the Maidoi, uh, the Medi, the, the Thracian Medi. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we're not really sure. But it's most likely the, the Dardanians who are the first enemy. And um, he he gifts um, 10 pikes, 10 pelter shields and 10 helmets to the sanctuary. Um, and these gifts are usually taken from enemies, so we kind of based off a, um, a speculative pike unit of that because they have this dis these disciplined formations, and because of this inscription. Um, so yeah, and you can have a lot of fun then when you play Dardania. You have something to look forward to. Yeah. Um, so you have a king, and we just assume he takes a bit of Paionia and Macedon and now borders the Macedonians, so he gets mm. an upgrade to his army. Um, so yeah, uh, but that's why they don't really have a lot of skirmishes and not really good cavalry, because um, the sources don't really tell us that they have any. <laughs> yeah, and this guy, this guy Beto the Mean, Barto the Mean, he, he he definitely has earned his name. He despises everyone. He despises Liburnians. He despises Histrians. Despises Iapodes. Abhors <laughs> Labeateans. Hates Macedonians. He just hates everyone. <laughs> He's like, nope. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I hadn't seen that, but that must be an inside joke. Um, <laughs> because we were figuring out the the diplomacy and I got constantly asked, like, um, are they allies to anyone? Are they friends with anyone? And I was like, no, not really. I think nobody really likes them. <laughs> um, we, we have them fight a lot against the Celts, probably, because mm. they somewhat expand into the Skordiski territory, but the Skordiski also at one point later, like way later, subjugate, probably subjugate the Dardanians mm. um, and force them with them on their campaigns. Um, they, pro they probably fight the Thracians a lot because they do the same things to the Thracians earlier, um, that they cooperate on campaigns with them and probably yeah. force them too. And um, yeah, so they fight the Thracians, they fight the Paeonians, they fight the Macedonians, they fight the Celts. Um, they're also really a little bit at conflict with the Illyrians, like with Queen Teuta, you have a lot of Illyrians switching sides to the Dardanians when they get beaten by the Romans. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, when the Illyrians get beaten by the Romans, a lot of them switch sides to the Dardanians. Um, so yeah, they're kind of at odds with everyone and um, only have like really, really temporary, temporary alliances. Mm. Um, so I uh, guess that was the result of it. And they and their sort of downfall is because of the Bastani, right? Being invited across. I can't remember exactly which Macedonian king it was who uh, invited them, and they raided the land, right? And then, you know, they never could really build up the strength again. Yeah, it's Philip. It's Philip V. He, Fifth, he is yeah. also a real. It's also a really long king because he fights like the first Macedonian war, where Rome is not really involved yet because they have. Um, they're occupied with Hannibal mm. and um, but Philip doesn't really come to help him um, and so the first war he really fights against the Romans is the second one and um, 
there it's there where the Romans um, use the Illyrians and the Dardanians um, as allies against him and um, kind of let them roam free into Macedonia through the Dasaretes and through Paeonia. And um, Philip tries a lot of ways to to have them not do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, he and um, his son Perseus, they um, kind of destroy the, um, I think it's, um, it's some mountain. <laughs> um, a, a round mount uh, something something um, they devastate the land so the Dardanians don't really have an easy way to get through Yeah. Um, and um, probably because there they can't supply their troops when they're on campaign and um, another trick he has up his sleeves is the arrival of the Bastane yeah. um, kind of Elto Germanic people question mark <laughs> um, who arrive in the Balkans and um, they send delegates to to the Greeks to the Macedonians um, and he's like yes come please I, I have a perfect <laughs> land for you it's it's just there yeah. <laughs> go and get it and um, so the Bastane have like this this huge migrating force which is um, probably as you can see quite usual for the Celts and Germanics yeah. and um, they invade Dardania. Sadly, this this piece of the source is only fragmentary. It seems they beat the Dardanians in battle quite decisively. Um, then the the source kind of breaks off, so we don't know what happens after. And it really comes back when we hear that the Bastane were on their were on their way back and crossed an, uh, a frozen river and all bro broke into the river and all drowned. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they um, they really must have written Dardania. Dardania has, has like several delegations to the Romans and to other Greeks begging for help um, against this unfairness of, of having Bastane in their lands. And um, they don't, they aren't really a considerable throw after that. So the Romans have like some problems with them. They um, they become a minor nuisance once Rome gets Macedonia. Because, well, Ardania likes to invade Macedon, and now yeah. it's just Macedon with Rome stamped on top. So <laughs> they still, inv they technically still invade the same territory, um, but with the help of the Thracian Maidoi and the Dentelete, and um, later, I think the Skordiski, or Skordiskoi, um, and the force them um, also into, into invading uh, Macedon and Greece. And I think they also get to Delphi, uh, a second time or a third time even I think Delphi gets gets pillaged a lot in this time <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah so um, I think they're really last notable as an enemy of Rome against Sulla um, in the Mithridatic Wars because um, like almost all the Thracians allied to uh, Mithridates and um, also also the Dardanians and um, Rome has like several campaigns into Thrace and a really decisive one into Dardania where they just take it and yeah. are, are done with it. <laughs> and so but by the time we get to, to Strabo, um, he writes um, really with a lot of disdain, um, basically that they live in dung caves and that <laughs> they... Um, um, Strabo, Strabo, really wild. Strabo loved absolutely slating everyone else, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he, he says they're wild, they dig caves beneath their dung hills and live <laughs> there. Um, but at least they still care for music because they make beautiful instruments, um, both flutes and stringed instruments. So at least they have that. <laughs> Good for acoustics, the caves. <laughs> like, yeah, may maybe the acoustic is really great uh, in this case. <laughs> no, I'm uh, he's he, uh, he's uh, probably also um, probably just has a lot of disdain and stereotypes about them. Um, they are probably quite impoverished um, thanks to the Romans, mm. um, but um, we can't really say for sure. It's, it becomes a notable re region again in Byzantine times, I think, but that's not really my area. Yeah.
No, cool. Really cool. One, one, one question then on, on these guys. You said that they were kind of lumped in as Illyrians by the uh, by Romans and Greeks, uh, you know, in later sources. But what what would the other cultural element be? Would it be would it be Celts? Would it be Thracians? What what is the thought on their culture? Because obviously they they've got their separate culture here, haven't they? As Dardanian. Um, mm -hmm. Is it so? Are they expressly Illyrians, or, or or they have their own Illyrian culture, or are they? I mean, all cultures are amalgamations, right? But what I'm trying to say is, like, what's the other sort of thoughts on the on the other half of the culture? Um, it's really hard to say. Like later Romans just say, yeah, here are the Dardanians, they are an Illyrian people, mm. and um, because they they just lump them in. Um, I've read some scholarship and they are also not really decided on the matter because um, there are discussions of like this this broad um, super alluring culture that was then applied to lots of people and um, that got criticized a bit later um, and it was a question are they maybe a bit more Thracian but also not really because not even the Paeonians are purely Thracians. Even the Paeonians are kind of their own thing. Mm. The Tribaloi are kind of their own thing. The Dadanoi are that. Um, and I even read something about them being Musian, Daco Musian, um, Daco Muso, Illyrian. We, we don't really know. We can't really figure that yeah. out. They are kind of probably their own thing. Um, but I'm also not really too deep into this um, question of ethnicity because these things are quite hard to figure out and read into especially if not all literature is um, is really easily translatable let's yeah. say <laughs> <laughs> right cool well uh, let's move on to are we going on to the Labeateans next I believe so let's move on to those guys yeah um, so we have the Labeateans um they are around uh, Lake Labiatus, <laughs> um, and that's probably where they got their name from. Um, they There are more settlements around it, but um, Skodra and Meteon are their main settlements in the sources. Um, and yeah, they, they are kind of interesting in the way in that the tribe itself is not really that notable. <laughs> um, <laughs> But like the, the the king really is their last king because he is called um, it's it's Gentios. Um, Gentios is called um, he, I sh he shouldn't be alive yet I think. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> no, because he he gets beaten some somewhere in in the hundred sixties BC, and um, so yeah, um, Gentios is called the last Illyrian king. Um, hmm. Also meant um, Illyria proper, like um, the South Illyria that the Greeks always refer to. And um, yeah, the Labiataeans, they are probably just um, one of the many, many smaller Illyrian tribes um, that we really can't all represent. Um, and to the Ardii, I previously mentioned the Ardii uh, with Agron and Teuta. And they're probably just allies of them. So we have um, in Teuta, and she has a general called Skerdilaidas. Um, and he, um, if I remember correctly, he kind of takes over <laughs> the um, basically Illyria after, um, after the Ardii. Um, since yeah, the, the Romans restrict the RDI movements to Lissos, as you have shown in your video. Yeah. And um, so Adron dies, right? Then there's a que uh, the war with Queen Teuta. And after she gets beaten and restricted to north of Lissos, and um, she is just the region for, uh, for her son, uh, Pinus. And Pinus mm -hmm. dies quite early. And after that, you get um, Demetrios of Pharos, um, which is in the north. It's a small Greek settlement near Issa. There, Pharos. Yeah. Um, 
Demetrius of Pharos is a um, general. He's called an Illyrian by um, by Polybius, but I think he just is a bit, um, <laughs> you know, against half Greeks, non Greeks. Um, he's probably somewhat Greek. Um, Demetrius, I mean, he, he has a Greek name. He's probably also somewhat Illyrian. Um, we can't really say. And um, he is a general for um, Philip V. And as Polybius repeatedly emphasizes, a really bad influence. <laughs> and um, he's also seemingly very opportunistic and he kind of takes control of, of the remnants of the Illyrian kingdom that get left behind by, by the RDI. And um, he also fights with the Romans in, I think, the Second Illyrian War. Um, and yeah, they they beat him, they um, take away his territory, which is also in Pharos, Issa, and Korkyra. And um, so then, and um, his general is also Skadilaidas. Um, and he switches sides to the Romans, so he becomes the new king of Illyria now. <laughs> <laughs> And um, yeah, he he um, founds a new dynasty, and it's probably uh, uh, the Lab Labiatian dynasty that he um, he's the founder of. And he's very loyal to the Romans. Um, previously, under Demetrius, he was a pirate, <laughs> and um, <laughs> as as they tend to be, yeah. and. Um, <laughs> um, so he he becomes a loyal ally to the Romans. He also fights on the side of the um, the Romans against Philip, I think, or at least his son does. Um, he has a son called Pleuratos, um, a popular name in Illyria. Hmm. <laughs> and um, Pleuratos is the Illyrian king at the time who invades Macedon together with the Dardanians. Um, so this is a quite loyal. Um, ally to the Romans in the area who are very interested in Illyria even though there's not a lot of focus on Illyria because it's kind of their backyard yeah um, there's a really nice um, map that kind of shows the the connection of the Adriatic Sea to Cisalpine Gaul and um, that Illyria is kind of the key to to holding Cisalpine Gaul because it is such a um, fertile landscape that can easily get ravaged by piracy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you have this war against Teuta um, in two hundred um, in the two hundred early two hundred twenties BC. You have the the conquest of Cisalpine Gaul, and then you have the war against Demetrius in two hundred twenty two hundred nineteen BC. Um, so the Romans kind of fight these wars back to back and they really care that that their coast is clean from piracy yeah um so that's that's why they um even before they expand to iberia which is which are much more famous campaigns um they really poke a, around a lot in in illyria to to kind of secure some allies and um lawyer kings because illyria has a lot of kings a lot of um, nobility and a lot of minor tribes and they just hope that that they can get some loyal kings who, who take care of the whole thing um, and Skerdilaidas and Pleuratos they are the Labiatine kings loyal to Rome and they rule from basically Lyssos, Etion and Skodra up to um, to Dalmatia so um, they should even have like what we gave um, the RDI at the moment, Nestos um, so this whole coast, basically. Yeah. And um, when Pleuratos dies, um, it's of course every time a king dies, it's a weakening of the dynasty. Mm. So a new tribe on the horizon takes um, takes this as an opportunity to attack, and those are the Dermate. This is where they appear for the first time, and they attack um, the Isaian. The colonies of Tragurion and Epetion, which are new settlements we um, gave them, and um, they attack the they attack the the Orsoi, um, also an ally of Rome. Like like I said, Rome 
secures a lot of allies in in this area. Yeah. Um. So after Peratos dies, Gentios becomes king. And um, at a similar time, Philip V dies, and um, his son Perseus becomes king. And Perseus tries to um, tries to get Gentius on his side to have have Illyria on his side. And um, yeah, bo they both fail spectacularly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this third Illyrian war against Gentius. Um, is, is really really short. It is said that the war was over before it reached reached Rome. Um, one source says it is twenty days. One other source says the war goes thirty days. Um, <laughs> because um, and you can look at at a minor Illyrian faction again for that. Um, Gentius prepares a lot of ships, a lot of troops. I think he has like fifteen thousand men uh, and a few hundred boats. And the first thing he goes for are the um, Illyrian allies of the Romans, like uh, Rison and um, other minor Illyrian peoples, like um, uh, the Indurnion, um, scroll over uh, to the south. Uh, yeah, the uh, Kawoi or Kavi, um, depending on, on the language you use. And they have some castles in like this border area between Illyria and Dardania, and he goes for it, and kind of fails. <laughs> <laughs> and like like I said, the Romans invade really really quickly, and the, the war is over in like 20 to 30 days. And um, Gentius is the last Illyrian king, and um, also known for being kind of rude and very drunk, which is a <laughs> typical stereotype for uh, for Illyrians that they are constantly drunk. Mm. Um, we, we get back to that later. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so yeah, um, he is the last Illyrian king, and after that, the Romans um, punish the Illyrians really harshly, um, except their allies. I think, um, except. The Daorsi, I think, except Rison, um, Bullis, the Partinoi, and the Talantians. I think. Except for them, they plunder like all of Illyria. <laughs> yeah. As a as a punishment. Um, everyone who hasn't switched sides quickly enough in this short war, um, which the Daorsi did. They they start out as allies of of the Illyrians and then quickly switch sides to the Romans. Yeah. Um, so they, they get spared. And yeah, so this really doesn't go well. And um, <laughs> it's at this point, Roman really has a firm foot in Illyria, um, in, in southern Illyria. Um, yeah. The north is a whole different uh, issue. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, I don't think I've got any questions on on these guys. So, um, uh, oh, we've, we forgot the units. So I, I think these guys have some unique units. Uh, they, they get, get to. they get their own Thurio Foroi after uh, after some reforms and right. do they get uh, I think it, oh they get light infantry don't they Labeate yes. and light infantry there we go yes. some light infantry boyos for them as well cool well uh, let's move on to the uh, RDAI then oh, oh, really quickly one last yep. thing well, one last thing um, Gentius does mint coins in in Skodra. And this is what we gave as a faction symbol, this um, this uh, Lembos this ship um, with the two prongs and the Illyrian sea snake beneath. And I really like this symbol. Uh, I think it's quite beautiful. And yeah. So um, if you look up Illyrian coins, these Skodra coins are probably among the first to show up. So um, yeah, cool. Yeah, and these were minted by often minted by Gentios or in Skodra um, by the Labiatians. Yeah, cool. Awesome. So on to okay. the RDAI, who were pretty influential, as we've already discussed uh, quite a bit about Queen Tutor and um, the people that came from the RDAI. So um, how influential were these guys? Um, very influential. Um, Strabo calls them one of the most powerful Illyrians of the past. Um, along with the Autariatai, uh, the Dadani, and 
And yeah, so the RDI are later on quite strong. Um, we expanded their starting position quite a bit. Um, if I had to thank a historian um, whose book I discovered um, quite deep into the research, um, I think she's called uh, Marietta uh, Chachel Kurs. And um, she wrote a lot about um, the historian Appian um, and his book on Illyria, one of our few sources who really focus on Illyria, even though it's quite short. And um, she really goes into detail um, about mainly like the northern area with the, the whole lot of minor tribes that are there. And the Adi are, um, as I said, one of the major people um, in Illyria. And um, they start out as neighbors to the Autariatai. Um, and we only gave them one settlement because they have been quite reduced to the past. Yeah. Um, you can imagine, yeah, there they are. Um, that the Autariatai rule the enti entire Illyrian hinterland, like um, where the um, Desitiates are now, um, the northern areas that we gave the, to the RDI, um, basically everything the, um, the Skordiskoi <coughs> rule. So um, the Autariatai are quite powerful and quite huge. Um, sometimes it is said they are the main rulers of Illyria. And then the Celts show up and um, probably just reduce them to a lot of lot smaller territory. Um, they also appear in, in the Anabasis of Alexander, where they are funnily enough called the least warlike people in Illyria. <laughs> um, because they, they try to prepare an ambush for Alexander and Alexander has like an, um, an ally come to him and is like, oh no, the Autariatai are preparing an ambush. Let me deal with them. They're really not warlike. Uh, that should be easy. And takes this opportunity ju to just plunder their lands. Um, <laughs> oh, maybe he God. just needed a reason. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so um, they used to be the main rivals of the Adiai. And they fought over salt springs, um, the sources say. Um, several say that. Um, and the historian I just mentioned, she locates them somewhere um, upstream the, um, the Naro River, which, and we placed uh, Narenziopolis there. Um, yeah, right. Um, that's kind of where these salt springs are located, probably, maybe, um, where mm. the territories of the, the RDI um, the initial RDI and the Autariatai must have met. Um, the Autariatai probably win this conflict, according to, I think, Apiran. Um, but they get weakened, they get um, basically destroyed. They, um, they are found as mercenaries, as soldiers in various armies, from, Dem um, from the Demate to the Macedonians in Thrace. In, in Getic land, so uh, Autariate get um, get destroyed and are just everywhere now, and so the RDI take power, um, and so we have them start in this in the Illyrian hinterland, mm. um, where they probably fought them, and more towards the coast, um, which they um, slowly expanded to. So um, they have their cap capital at Rizon, um, one of the major settlements in the area, because the Gulf of Rizon is um, is a really good port. It's a protected port um, that allows them to get a lot of ships in the water and conduct piracy. And the RDI are really known for their um, piracy activities. And um, yeah, so this whole expansion probably happens under Pleuratos. Uh, who, who you just saw in, in Rizon and um, and his son uh, Agron, who we have mentioned mm. and um, yeah, so Agron later, as I said he um, he helps Arcananians um, and and beats off the Aetolians and then he gets so happy he, he drinks himself to death <laughs> 
<laughs> God, yeah. that's that is one party. You must must have been a good victory. It's really funny um, because most anecdotes about the Illyrians have two things to say about them. A, they really drink a lot, seemingly, <laughs> <laughs> and um, they're quite nice to women. Um, especially in the eyes of the Greeks, who usually weren't. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is um, a text by a Roman author um, on agriculture, and he also has a section on the Illyrians, where he says, um, or he has this whole deal about um, what what it takes to um, to get into agriculture, to herd cattle, and um, also kind of. Huh, uh, huh discussion about what women should do in this case blah 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 and she's like oh yeah women should be strong when they herd cattle like the Illyrian women um, mm. who are strong and take care of herds and they can carry firewood in one hand and a baby in the other easily and um, this is written in, in a dialogue and I, I think he says in, in Liburnia and in Illyria he has seen um, a woman who is pregnant just um, notices that she's that that the kid is coming, so she just gets in, into a quiet place, gives birth, and then returns with a baby in one hand, like she found it somewhere. <laughs> um, that's really what the source says, like like she found it somewhere. Um, so, um, and you have this whole deal about, um, like I mentioned, the the. Lyrian daughter, Oridike, who is also involved in the wars of succession in Macedon. We have Queen Teuta. So the Lyrians really have a, um, are really known to be a lot nicer to women. Now I have to say, relatively, of course, because yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's still the ancient world, but um, they definitely probably have more say there than in Greece, um, because one fragment even says that, um, that like it's a special thing that the Illyrian men take their women with them to entertainment um, and I think it's in Athens where where women aren't allowed in the in the stadium and in, in, oh really um, fe festivals yeah I didn't so know it's that. a special yeah and it's a um, there's a, this whole thing about women not being allowed to leave the house without the men and so on and so it's a really special thing that um, this fragment um, basically says that um, the Illyrian men take their wives to entertainments. Um, they are also the women are also the ones who pledge their guests at uh, parties, um, and they lead home their husbands from drinking parties, <laughs> where we are at the drinking stereotype again. And um, then it's again emphasized how much they drink. <laughs> And um, it also the RDI have a lot of slaves that are a bit like the Spartan helots. And um, they're also known for preparing lots of parties for entertainment and drinking. So we should take all these sources with a grain of salt, of course. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, this is a stereotype that is especially um, attached to the RDI. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. Really interesting. So, um, obviously, uh, these guys, obviously, Queen Tutor expanded really far down to uh, Lissos. And then there was the treaty with the Romans, wasn't there, that, that completely crushed them, basically, um, saying yeah. that they couldn't go further south than Lissos. So they couldn't raid the Peloponnese or, or into Greece, which, as we've seen so far, was uh, an Illyrian pastime raiding Greece. Uh, <laughs> one of yeah. the favorite pastimes. I mean, to be fair, it was quite a lot of people's favorite pastimes, wasn't it? <laughs> Let's be honest. Yeah, true. Um, um, sorry, Percy. Uh, Percy activities are often um, a symptom for like uh, impoverished lands or war-torn lands, and um, because these men are in a lot of wars and they notice that they're really good at them and they, that you can get quite rich off of plunder. Yeah. And so um, Illyria, especially the northern northern Illyria, is not really a fertile region in, in this 
you see kind of a lot of these mountains. Um, the RDI territory is not really good for farming, so um, that might have been that on the coast they took up uh, pirate activities. Um, there are some more fertile regions, but yeah. There's also the point, I think it's Drabo who says that after the um, that the RDI annoyed the Romans so much with their um, piracy um, that they resettled them from the coast and forced them to, to do agriculture, but the land wasn't really good for agriculture, yeah. so they almost all starved. Oh, God. Um, so this is kind of a bit of Roman... Um, Freedom. Bu bureaucracy <laughs> of going, ah, can, I don't know, let's just settle them somewhere and force them to do to do agriculture, I guess. Maybe then they are be quiet. Um, so yeah, this was um, a really bad move. I think it's how he says that, that they it almost um, wiped out by, by this decision um, yeah. to get resettled from the coast further inland. Um, so yeah, as you said, um, they, they started a war with the Romans. Um, Toyta has some um, ambassadors of the Romans either imprisoned or killed, depending on the source. Maybe both. And um, because um, a Roman ally, Issa, in Illyria, which, which we already uh, have shown, um, they are kind of threatened by the Illyrians, so they call in... Uh, not just Issa, also Apollonia, as I mentioned, and so they call in the Romans for help, and um, the Romans reduce their army, they restrict their movements, uh, their military movements um, south of Lysos, so they can't keep raiding the Greek cities there, and um, yeah, so this is kind of how the the Adyian hegemony ends, um, but um, yeah, it, it, it was relatively short. Um, but nonetheless really interesting, especially because they are probably the ones who took out the remnants of the Illyrian Kingdom and uh, mm. must have controlled a quite sizable chunk of lands of, um, of the coast and Illyria because the, the subsequent kings of Skedilaidos and Gentios and so on, they kind of just inherit the whole thing every time there's a dynasty change. Yeah. Um, so there's always the king of Illyria, and he always seems to to rule from um, Dam um, from the Damascian coast down to Lysos, and yeah. um, that's probably thanks to the RDI. Mm. So they basically sort of established pretty much a uh, an established border, really. I guess you would say in in such transient times, but an established border of where an Illyrian kingdom would be, at least. Yes, somewhat. Uh, it's probably that um, that they kind of see themselves as um, like the Greeks see, have like Hellas, mm. Greece, but they don't really have a um, a unified Greece. Um, the Illyrians also might probably see themselves as Illyrian, but the the strongest king kind of rules. But they often have many kings, which is kind of yeah. an issue. Um, there are several scholarship opinions on this. Um, um, Papa Zoglu, um, a scholar, I think, in, in the 70s, she even argued for uh, an Illyrian kingdom that reaches from um, the Dalmatian coast down to, to Apollonia. And um, uh, this is not really accepted because we have so many accounts of different Illyrian kings. Um, but there are probably attempts to, to kind of get all these minor tribes into into major alliance and mm. um, no one really quite succeeded, but um, the attempts were there. Yeah, cool. Ah, cool. Well, uh, very influential player, I would say, the RDAI, and also probably going to be quite a... Uh, a nice little faction to play. Obviously, you've got a three uh, three sort of smaller areas, two villages there, uh, but you do have two large towns down south and some pretty easy uh, rebel territories to take as well. So I think you can probably get some decent uh, expansion going with these guys. Um, in terms of their units, I think they have the standard Southern Illyrian roster, don't they? 
Um, yeah. But they may have they may have uh, another unit or two. So that I think concludes all the southern Illyrians. So uh, shall we move on to uh, maybe the day city eights? So let's move on to the day city eights northeast of the RDAI uh, up here in sort of the hinterlands away from the coast. These guys. So um, I'm assuming these guys were not pirates then. Uh, no, definitely not. They are um, a very minor tribe. Um, with them, we have a kind of Delmato Pannonian representation as a faction. Um, but in the sources, they appear very, very, very late. Um, mm. So <clears throat> they are really uh, one of many of those many minor tribes that I mentioned. Um, but the most powerful of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, they might have been part of the Autariatai, who I mentioned earlier. Um, until those were destroyed and they probably just got um, their own little independence from then on. And um, in the sources, specifically, they appear during the Great Illyrian Revolt. So their first mention is basically um, in the first years AD, <laughs> um, yeah. I think. 4 to 9 AD is this revolt. Um, it's a huge revolt. Um, and you have um, one of the leader is a Desitiatian. De De Desitia My Lord. I can't pronounce that. Sorry. <laughs> Neither can <laughs> I, so it's fine. <laughs> and um, Bato, um, it's, it's really funny because it, um, there are three leaders, I think. Um, Bato's one of them, and they all end up killing each other. Mm. And um, they're not really uh, unified in their in their revolt. Um, the sources say they start with out with like eight hundred thousand men um, or eight hundred thousand people with uh, two hundred thousand fighting men, and this might just be the entirety of those they can mobilize. Um, like they, um, I compare it often to this Polybius section where he mentions all the Roman allies and the manpower they have with like a number of 700,000 up to 800,000 and um, which basically just shows the manpower they could potentially have mm. but can't never uh, can never really realistically mobilize otherwise they'd all starve to death yeah uh, <laughs> Because you can't just take all the all the men of fighting age into into the field. So, yeah. Huh? And um, so this number of eight hundred thousand desitiates and two hundred thousand fighting men explicitly probably just says this is the potential number of warriors they could have, mm. but the revolt very quickly shows um, that um, that this doesn't really hold up because the Romans invade. And um, even before any battle, battles start happening, half of the, the Illyrians who revolted already um, surrender. Um, and the Desitiates are among the last ones to surrender. Yeah. Um, but it's questionable if that's a good thing because they're <laughs> technically like the last ones standing. But like I said, because Bato also kills one of the other leaders who also previously killed another leader and um, the Desitiates are probably among the, or are called the most warlike or among the bravest Desitiat uh, Pannonians but um, really it doesn't really make a difference against the Romans um, but the Romans take this this revolt quite seriously they they prepared an invasion of um, of Germanic lands, of the, the Makomani, mm. and had like a huge number of legions ready. This is um, shortly before this um, really famous battle at Tudebok Forest. Um, and they want, wanted to, to invade the Makomani with like a huge force. And this Pannonian revolt is um, kind of what distracts them from that. So they they offer the Makomani a peace, um, which they happily take. Uh, took because they didn't want to be invaded by the Romans with yeah. such a huge army, and they redirect um, this this giant army. Um, I'd have to look up how many legions um, there were. Think, was it seven? Was it seventy cohorts? Something like that. Uh, yeah, something 
along those lines. It's it's a really great number of troops, which mm. which shows that when it um, when the sources say those are there are two hundred thousand fighting men, um, it's probably in the eyes of the Romans probably close to that that they perceived it this way, um, because. Um, yeah, it's it's ten to fifteen legions and seventy cohorts of auxiliary, mm. and um, another fifteen um, array of cavalry with a lot of allies of Thracians and veterans and volunteers. Yeah. So um, yeah, ten to fifteen legions like uh, this. This is a huge force yeah. um, a- around um, estimate estimates around 100,000 legionaries just for this campaign so yeah it was a really really dangerous situation in, in uh, it's the a big eyes revolt. of the Romans <laughs> yeah um, and they didn't want to lose th- this land because it really spread like wildfire and like I said um, they really got it um, pacified quite quickly I mean it's a, it's a war of like um, of a few years yeah um, but the, the, they were they were afraid of, of this revolt um, because a lot of them um, we might get to them when we update the Romans who knows yeah um, but a, but a lot of them were at the time um, have been subjects of Rome and been extensively recruited into the legion so there were a lot of experienced commanders and yeah. um, troops on the sides of the Pannonians and um, Desitiatus and Delirians who revolted and m- a lot of findings in, in the nearby river, I think the, the Savus um, a lot of findings of equipment it's basically just Roman hmm. um, we can't really say if it's from the from the Pannonians or the Illyrians or the Romans, it might have been from everyone, um, because yeah. at this point they were probably all just armed like Romans hmm. um so yeah, it it could have been dangerous, and this is why they were the most prominent tribe in this revolt, which is why we represented them. Um, cool. But yeah, yeah, I think, I think uh, yeah. Again, <laughs> sources pinch of salt. Eight hundred thousand is quite quite a lot. I mean, that would be yeah. <laughs> that would be what the largest army that's seen on Europe apart. Um, is that even bigger than Napoleon's invasion of Russia? I, I can't. I can't remember. I thought that was about eight hundred and fifty thousand, but that would be the largest. The largest up until like between those two points, surely. So that is monstrous. But I think, I think you know, maybe eight hundred thousand is a little bit, a little bit out there. But what you yeah, like, definitely. obviously, with the uh, with the the response, it was clearly. A, very very massive revolt and something that the romans were very very uh, scared of especially at that period of time when the empire was still was quite large by that point wasn't it so um yeah th- this was not it's, a it... uh, not a <laughs> not like a, a tiny little tin pot revolt that they sent the young boys off to fight like it was clearly something that was very severe and, and very scary for them yeah it's it's more than um or it's around 30 years into the reign of Augustus like mm. he he's just securing his borders in, in um, Iberia and in Germania he's preparing because uh, he's pre- preparing an invasion of Germania because um, the the Marcomanni are are kind of looking a bit strong with also I think like 70,000 men or something and um, this is just something he doesn't want to have, so he yeah. he prepares that. So suddenly, this huge revolt just happening basically in the backyard of Italy is suddenly really scary. And <laughs> we don't, we sadly don't have so that many sources on it. But um, yeah, it, it must at the time it must have been quite notable, at least when it broke out. Yeah definitely that's i mean it lasted a few years as well didn't it it wasn't just like one battle bang everyone's gone like it was 20 or 30 days (laughs) yeah yeah exactly yeah (laughs) not like the old uh 20 or 30 day war no it was uh really serious so that's really cool uh i like these guys i think it's going to be a very difficult start this might be the hardest start 
of the Illyrians, honestly, looking at them. Although I have heard the Illyrian Kingdom is, um, from some of the beta testers, that the Illyrian Kingdom is very difficult being sandwiched between the Macedonians and the Epirotes. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, um, but yeah, this might be one for those uh, those challenge hunters out there like myself to, uh, to play. Uh, because you're quite far from the coast. You've got to get through at least two settlements to get to the coast to then trade and actually make money. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this will be a, an interesting one, I feel, to play for all you uh, difficulty hunters. Um, in terms of their, they have, of course, we're on the Northern Illyrians now, so they do get the Northern Illyrian roster. Uh, and then they have their own unit of cavalry, the uh, Day City 8 cavalry over here, which is sort of a skirmisher cav, I believe. Yeah. Cool. So let's now move on to the uh, Del Mate. So here we are with the Del Mate after we've just been speaking about pronunciation for quite quite a while. So uh, <laughs> yes, we're on to the Del Mate, not the Dal Mate, the Del Mate. <laughs> um, and these guys obviously bordering Issa. So I'm assuming they were pretty big rivals to Issa then in this area. Yeah, definitely. Um, like I said, with the... Oh, which section was this? Was this the... Uh, I think the Laviatai. Um, after after Poiratos, the Laviatai and King Dais, who was quite loyal to Rome, um, they revolt from the Illyrian Kingdom and just in invade around them. Mm. Um, we have them still represented. Um, and... Um, they were known to be quite powerful um, and it's in 158 BC yeah, where, where Pleuratus dies and they immediately go on to attack Tragurion, Epetion and Daorson. Um, so yeah, the, the cities of the Assyrians and uh, Issa still was an ally of Rome. Mm. Um, I always like to say that Rome tries to get its foot in into an area to to have um, the the reason to intervene. Yeah, and Issa, on several occasions, was was this foot in the door in Illyria, um, because Issa, of course, was a very attractive city for trade. It knew that, so um, it was to the benefit of Issa to be allied to someone as powerful as the Romans. Mm. And the Romans had a lot of benefits of being allied to Issa. Um, so yeah, and the Damate attacked um, the two colonies of Issa on the mainland. And um, the Orson, also um, a quite powerful Illyrian city-state basically at this point. And Rome intervenes. And um, the Demate are really one of the the people Rome fights the longest against mm. in in Syria. They, um, when you read like all the campaigns they start and finish against them, even successfully, you have like um, I had to check a little bit when I noted this down. Um, they have in 155 BC, Nazica subdues them in. 117 BC, Metellus subdues them again. <laughs> and in 35 BC, Augustus defeats them. And in 34 BC, a year later, subdues them. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, they're, they're, uh, in between, they also take Promona from the Liburni in 50 BC. Um, and Caesar couldn't really deal with them because he was busy with a civil war two years later. Um, and um, he tries to get reinforcements for the civil war through Illyria and the Demate uh, misinterpret this um, reinforcements and think they get pun punched now so they just destroy the legion <laughs> Fair and, play. Caesar and yeah and Caesar really doesn't do anything against this because he's busy yeah. and so just, just 10 years later Augustus comes back in 35 BC um, to, to end their shenanigans, um, seemingly because there's another war against them. <laughs> yeah. And I think 15 BC, um, if I remember co correctly. So, so yeah, there are quite a lot of wars against them. And probably they get split up, probably. 
Um, but they might have been involved in the Danmato Illyrian Pannonian Revolt too. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, Rome had a lot of respect for them. They they end up um, calling the region just um, Dalmatia, uh, Dalmatia. Yeah. Which the coast is still called the Dalmatian coast, so this really um, stuck. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, they were they were quite warlike. Um, they are quite isolationist, funnily enough, um, and kind of, they're they're kind of weird for 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 our ancient authors because um, the the neighbor the neighbors the Liburnians the other Illyrians they are quite ready to trade. Like all of them are also pirates often, but but they're mm. also all quite re ready to trade and yeah. import Greek wares and. Um, stuff like that and the Denmati don't really do that and there's a really cool article I think it's um, called beverages something something and um, it's also about beer <laughs> 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 alcoholic beverages and resistance to Roman imperialism in Dalmatia oh, wow. genius article it's about how the Dalmatians um, almost as a uh, just drink beer kind of as a resistance to the wine drinking of the Romans and Greeks because they're one nice. of among the few peoples other than the Liburnians as I said who don't import Greek wares and even explicitly don't import wine mm. um, so probably this whole invasion of, of the science also falls in um, into a time where they're really forming their own identity and um, really um, try to not build any connections to the Greeks and to the Romans and, and show their, their own thing because they come from, um, must have come from inland, from Damium and at the start of the 3rd century, so around starting date, they, they, they must have expanded towards the coast because um, this is around the time we get a lot of fortresses yeah. Um, from them in the area. Um, there's even um, a letter by by a Roman officer, I think, to Cicero, um, who served, who, um, not Cicero, but the, but this officer, the friend, um, who serves in a campaign against them. Mm. And um, he says that... Um, there are 13, uh, 30 ancient cities in Dalmatia, and they have, by this point, annexed 60 more. Um, so, coming around to 90 cities in the lands of the Dalmatians. And, um, cool. Also, Strabo has a lot, lot to say about um, their many regions and fortresses, so they're quite powerful, and that's, this is why Rome struggles a lot with them once, once they start really coming to the scene and um, invading their neighbors. Awesome. So yeah, these these guys like tended to, seems like tended to expand a bit, get subdued by someone and then rebel, <laughs> free themselves. And then, you know, a next generation, same thing would happen. Then next generation, same thing would happen. So they're clearly a very hardy and resistant people i guess and obviously were strong enough to uh fight wars against the romans which not everyone was at this time so um yeah like, m most who try to fight wars against the romans get like taken out in, in a single war es especially yeah a single tribe or something but um they must have been quite a powerful confederation because um i mean for, from when they first entered the scene in 158 bc um, the scene from the view of the Romans in 150 yeah. BC and they just get subdued in like 30 BC or maybe even a bit later mm. um, so roughly 120 130, 150 years <laughs> yeah. fighting against the Romans in wow. recent war. so um, this is quite quite impressive yeah um, Yeah, and they're also very interesting in, in their culture because um, Strabo notes that they redistribute their land every seven years mm. um, to their population, so that 
um, probably so no noble rivalries um, can um, can take hold. Um, must have been probably an old tradition um, from their formative years, but um, yeah, there's something notable about them that um, that they kind of try to um, get equal land um, for their probably for their major families or clans. So um, there isn't any rivalry or, or envy. Yeah, there's no uh, backstabbing going on, unlike every other <laughs> every other <laughs> every other society at the time. <laughs> um, no, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, in terms of their units, then I think they have a unique unit at the minute. Obviously, like I said earlier, guys, there's going to be some more units added into some of these rosters as well. So they get the Dalmatian footman over here which are a yeah. foot unit. Um, and with... they should get... Oh, yeah. Sorry, Sorry. go on. Um, and they should get another reform unit, but uh, I yeah. want to let you speak. <laughs> and they've got, like, a, a little tiny sword here <laughs> ready to uh, ready to chop up the enemy, I guess. Pretty cool. I yeah. like the look at those guys. Yeah, um, they're... The Illyrians were known for their curved swords. I mm. mentioned one Illyrian knife um, for so Pyrus. Um, it, 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 with Pyrus, right? And um, yeah, the Romans called it Sika because the Romans just mm. called knives Sika. Yeah. Um, and the Illyrian knives, they had a variety of them, but they were quite short and um, bent um, or curved. Yeah. And um, yeah, they, they were. Um, they're probably one of the main melee weapons in in, um, in Illyria um, in different shapes um, depending on on the specific culture. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so it, it sometimes looks a bit weird that it's so short, but I mean the Romans also use short swords. So. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. So I think uh, we'll move on to probably the Iapodes next. Then let's go. So on to the Iapodes, there we go, <laughs> the Iapodes, uh, on to these guys next with their capital at Metalum. Um, these guys, so they don't have much coastal lands, so were they mainly, again, another inland tribe? Yeah, they're probably similar to the Del Mate in the way that they sort of migrated towards the coast, which is not unusual at the time. I mean, the RDI did it, um, the Demate did it, and the um, Yapodes are also doing it. They're in the process of doing it. And um, yeah, because that's where the trade is, that's where the, the rich cities are. And um, yeah, like like most of Northern Illyria, you might, may have noticed with the Demate and the uh, Desitiates, um, the Northern Illyrians always tend to appear a bit later in our sources because mm. um, probably either they're not really that important yet at the start date, not important enough um, to the to all the war that is happening in the um, Mediterranean, like yeah. the, the successor wars and the Punic Wars, and so a, a few Illyrians beating each other up is probably not that important to the ancient writers. Um, so yeah, also, so the uh, Yapodes, even though we can, um, we know that they must have been there quite early. Um, yeah, they're already attested in the 9th and 8th century BC, uh, BC um, in, in the general area, um, further inland. Um, we first hear about them um, in like a campaign in 129 BC. So like um, seven centuries later, <laughs> yeah. After having already settled there, and um, yeah, so they're in conflict with the Liburnians. Um, they kind of take away their cities um, on the coast, and um, are a general nuisance in the area. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah, uh, cool. they're minor people, um, and. Well, th these are the ones that um, was it Augustus? No, uh, sorry, not Augustus. Those, sorry, that, yeah, way earlier than Augustus. Like 
was that their campaign in 129 whoever was fighting in uh, Macedon came back through the land and raided it and they sent a petition to the to the senate saying like what are you doing this is this is terrible why why are you raiding us we we're not we're not Macedon <laughs> yeah um it's in probably uh yeah, yeah it's in in 171 bc 171 um, that they that they send a delegation to the senate um because of the of a campaign of cassius longinus yeah um who who marches through their land and um he just le lets his army self-supply by plundering which um armies often did um, yeah when they were in in foreign lands sadly um so yeah he, he marched his armies through there um probably wanting to get to macedon and i think he he decided against it or he, um he didn't need it to be there anymore so he just wanted back and forth and just went went through the territory plundering um so they were already known to the romans by then uh, definitely mm -hmm. um but um we don't really hear a lot um of them before that but um when they have um diplomatic contact to the romans it's it's pretty clear that um, that they were known to them and um, had like established relations and probably friendly relations when when they sent a delegation to to complain about uh, a commander stepping out of line yeah oh cool well at least like they were at least important enough for the senate to hear them and not just turn them away i guess and uh yeah yeah cool. i mean the the senate kind of um tried to keep their um the commanders in line um mm. because it's especially this time like around the 150s 40s 30s we see that um rome really expands what well, has expanded way beyond italy um uh, we um the, the romans already have most of iberia at this point and a lot of yeah. Asia Minor um have their foot in in the politics of of the remaining um successors and um so yeah the, the senate tries to not have the um have the commanders do lots of bad things when they're in uh, friendly territory in, in other territory not just friendly they just don't want um any problems with like um other other peoples because it could also always mean war and trouble um so mm. yeah um but I mean, they they later do um, fight several campaigns against the uh, Yapodes and um, eventually subdue them. I think also with Augustus. Um, yeah, Augustus in, in in the in 35 BC really um, conquers a lot of remaining Illyria, um, which hadn't been conquered yet at this point and he conquers the Yapodes and Illyrians and Pannonians up to uh, Segestica. Yeah. And then uh, obviously like Metalum and these cities became pretty rich, didn't they, under Roman Roman rule, I think. Yeah. Um, I think um, Metalum um yeah, they, they continue into the Roman period and uh, Metalum becomes a, a municipium and um, so a lot of these of these cities kind of profit or at least the, the people you have to say also that Rome settles a lot of people in these territories that yeah. are not native so those are often the ones that um, that profit of um, the Roman trade in the area, and but yeah, the the uh, trading lanes kind of go through these cities um, from the Gestica, from the major city uh, river cities, um, and the cities on the Adriatic coast. Um, there's a lot of trade flowing there, mm. and um, there's also the the Amber Road to the north. Um, in Germania that kind of leads down into Illyria um, so trading wise it is a rich region but um, 
only basically also through the connectiveness of the Roman Empire, which kind of brings all these resources from A to B, but um, more to their own profit and sometimes to the detriment of the locals. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, we can't really argue um, that they would have been too happy for a long time when, like, the entire province revolts. Mm. Um, yeah. 30 years later, but... Um, yeah, this is um, this is all deep into Roman times and uh, yeah. far away from our starting date. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of their uh, their units, then these guys are Delmato Pannonian as well, aren't they? I believe. Yeah, Delmato Pannonian. Um, so, do they have any? Yeah, they've got an Iapodian elite spearman, and I believe they've got a sort of a unique. Horseman as well, yeah. Iapodian uh, skirmisher cav, so another skirmisher cav unit too, uh, which yeah, is this cool. Is probably something that will get changed a bit. So yeah, so um, so like the, the, sorry, some of the northern was, uh, sorry, some of the northern rosters are still a bit work in progress, um, especially cavalry wise. But yeah, the the Iapodus spearman that you just uh, showed, the um, elite spearman and the uh, swordsman, I think they have a swordsman in in the in the roster. Um, in the city, I think. Oh uh, yes, they get it after uh, controlling after three. Yeah, three Celtic settlements. Yeah, um, it's probably also a bit of a stereotype of the sources, but um, it is said that they that their equipment is Celtic, basically. Oh, cool. Um, but they are that they are culturally still Illyrian, which which is funny because scholarship doesn't really consider the um, Yapodes to be Illyrians. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Strabo says um, they have tattoos like the rest of the Illyrians, but their armor is um, Celtic. So oh, we okay. gave them these two elite units with mail and um, yeah, Reos shields and um, the helmets that were kind of in at the time in this area <laughs> yeah nice cool uh well i think uh we can then move on to the laburni probably my favorite faction in terms of what i've seen of them so far <laughs> so now we're on to the laburni and we were just talking about it i think one of the factions that i would love to play because they can become an absolute powerhouse in this region just based on their starting position and how many settlements they have with ports at the start of the game as well. Um, and these guys were pretty big time pirates, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, they are one of the older Illyrian peoples known to us. Um, of course, again, a, a bit of a um, controversial thing to refer to them as Illyrians um, because they are probably kind of their own thing. Um, and they are known quite early, like um, like I said previously, the Mate, the uh, Yapodes, the Desitiatus, they are, uh, in the sources they all appear quite late, uh, mainly in Roman sources when Rome starts expanding into this area. Mm. But the Liburnians, they appear very, very early, already in uh, Hecateus, I think in the um, 6th century BC, so... Um, Wow. They are known to the Greeks already, to Greek travelers. Mm. And we have um, we have a source, a uh, pseudo uh, Skylex, who I think uses Hecateus as a source too, but um, who also who makes like a traveling guide along the coasts of the Mediterranean. And he also already mentions the Libonians, um, which is kind of funny because he, he mentions it. Um, Istrians, the Liburnians, and then come the Illyrians in his statement. So the Illyrians just starts south of them, basically. Um, but um, yeah, they have all these little um, islands um, and a lot of settlements on them. Um, they have had a so called, um, I need to, uh, Thalog. <laughs> um, uh, Thalassocracy. 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 Yeah. Thalassocracy. 
um, <laughs> pronunciation, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, this is um, attested um, quite early on because um, they probably ruled over the entire eastern coast of the Adriatic Sea in the 8th or 7th century BC. And um, we know that they had all this influence because they did a lot of raiding on both sides of the coast, uh, or on both uh, coasts, uh, in Italy and in Illyria. And um, there is this episode um, in, I think, Appian, where um, the Taulentians um, help the Corcuraeans um, with the foundation of Epidamnos. Um, where we also have like the first account of the Talantians existing um, because they resist um, the Liburnians in Epidamnos which is uh, very interesting yeah um, they probably get beaten back bit by bit um, and um, because they conduct a lot of piracy in the area <laughs> they have influence in Italy and in Apulia in, in southern Italy uh, southeastern Italy like the heel of the, of, of the peninsula and um, the tyrant of Syracuse um, Dionysios he um, starts colonizing the Adriatic Sea um, he founds the city of um, Ancona of Issa and um, probably he's also the one who kind of reduces their influence in the southern and uh, central Adriatic Sea um, so they get weakened by uh, quite a bit, and then again um, by the creeping power that is the Yapudis. <laughs> yeah. Um, so by the time we meet them again in the fourth century BC in pseudo Skulak, they they just ruled over these islands um, and the many settlements on them. Um, but it's quite they are quite interesting because um, as I previously mentioned. Um, even among the Illyrians, um, pseudo Skulax um, notes that they are um, the ones that have women as rulers, um, probably more along the southern islands, um, I think. Yeah, and um, it's also there where, um, with this episode that I mentioned previously with Varro um, in his work on agriculture. Um, where he says that the Liburnian mothers uh, were seen carrying logs in one uh, wood logs in one hand and feeding their baby on their breasts in the other one. Um, so yeah, they were known to be more friendly towards women at the very least. Um, though we can sometimes expect to, like, sources to um, uh, to not really tell the truth because. Um, they kind of want to make things more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, probably in relative terms they were um, more friendly um, or more equal. Uh, or women had more rights in, in like Greece or in, in Rome. Yeah. Um, but we don't really know a lot about them beyond that. Um, we know a few names of the gods, we know a few names thanks to inscriptions, though, um, like with the Iapodes and the Desitiates and the Delmate. A lot of inscriptions only come during Roman rule and um, are like remains of, of the people living there, but um, everything should be taken with a grain of salt in this area, generally. Um, so, yeah, Rome also gets interested there um, for their operations inland um, so naturally they try to conquer <laughs> the yeah. Liburnians and, um, this is not really a very long affair um, the n wars against the Liburnians aren't really quite notable um, which is kind of kind of sad but um, what is interesting is that um, they have boats named after them um, cool. Uh, I think the Liburne uh, is what the um, ships are called. These are little creek um, 
we, we don't have yet we don't have them yet in the mod yeah <laughs> um, but um, those are little quick boats um, compared to the bigger warships of the Greeks and Romans and um, after Rome takes out Liburnia, they they also just annex all the boats and are like, hey, now we got a bigger fleet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, really worth it. Um, so Rome also uses them against the uh, Um We have, interestingly enough, we have the city of Promona. And um, it's really funny because I think we first had them for the Demate. Then Mausolos came in and said, no, um, in, during Caesar's time, uh, Caesar, Caesar intervenes because the Mate attacked the Liburnians in Promona. So then we gave it to the Liburnians because we can could assume that they had it first. Yeah. But then I found out that archaeolo archaeologically, Promona is a Dalmatian uh, fortress, Dalmate fortress, um, because it was found <laughs> archaeologically and the Liburnians and the Dalmate built quite different styles of fortresses oh, and cool. Pomona is seemingly quite clearly a Dalmate foundation so um, yeah it was probably taken away at some point um, by the Liburnians and just they just kept it or maybe it was given to them by the Romans yeah. Uh, for being good little allies and then attacked by the Demate and so Rome intervened in this um, in this conflict. Cool. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I like these guys. Yeah, I like them quite too. Um, the faction symbol is based of a stone relief of a um, naval fight. Um, it's one of the few um, depictions of the Liburnians we get the area nice and, um, this is one of the ship the ships that is um, involved in the combat so yeah we took this uh, as a faction symbol um, we kind of um, we couldn't go with a ship for every faction symbol because they yeah. all liked minting ships on coins <laughs> yeah or depicting ships on their on their stone reliefs or on their um, on their belt plates I mean, a lot of them, a lot of the Illyrians are sailors and pirates and um, traders. So, um, but I think it's quite fitting for the Liburnians because they are like the known pirate people yeah. in this area of Illyria. So, um, awesome. in my opinion, they had to get the ship. Yeah, I, I really like it. Anyway, I think it's really cool, um, and they get fittingly. Liburnian pirates, <laughs> which is cool, yeah. um, and they wield a hammer, guys. So uh, the Thinoi Clubman versus them will be an interesting fight. And um, if you want some, yeah, true. if you want, if you want some role players, Robert Baratheon or, or something like that, then uh, get the Liburnian pirates. Although I, you know, they're not that big hammers, but <laughs> they're still hammers. <laughs> Um, very cool. Now I see why you want to. Now I see why you want to play them. You just <laughs> like uh, those with, with clubs. <laughs> yeah, basically. I like I like uh, blunt weapons. Um, so yeah, uh, these guys. These guys. I think as a as a play uh, playing them as well. They're going to be a powerhouse in this region uh, with the amount of settlements they start with, with the amount of sea trade that you can probably generate pretty quickly, especially if you go down to Issa. Um, I think you could become pretty rich and even maybe threaten Rome if you want to, which will be a really, really fun campaign. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's move on to the uh, the history sort of uh, venetic people of the history. So then, let's move on to the history um, over here in the very far north of Illyria on the uh, Histrian Peninsula. Uh, is the peninsula right? The history in peninsula. Um, yeah, it's a history in peninsula. Oh, history and um, it, it's it's both. Yeah, cool, <laughs> fantastic. Um, and these guys relatively small, but they are a Venetic faction, so they have their own culture. And is that again to symbolise the fact that you know they were lumped in as Illyrians, but maybe were their own thing again? 
Yeah, they're um, they're somewhat venetic, but also not quite. Um, they're mostly influenced by the venetic peoples, but um, there's also a bit of Etruscan in there. There's a bit of Greek mm. in there, a little bit of Lurian, Yapodian, Libuan, basically everyone uh, around <laughs> them. Um, and we we find Greek wares and ceramics from trade. Um, also Etruscan wares. Um, they are probably most closely related to the Veneti, but um, it, it's all a bit um, complicated for, for the history. And um, yeah, but nonetheless interesting um, because they are also or, or have also settled there quite early on the history in Peninsula. Um, I think even in the in the ninth century BC already. Um, there are these kind of kinds of people, um, or even earlier, I think, 10th 10, 10th century, 11th century BC. Um, lot, lots wow. of bronze items and um, lots of um, great uh, traces of trade uh, throughout the ages, basically. But um, yeah, yeah, and uh, the historians, they are very interesting in. And so far that we have them, um, we have evidence for them quite early, but um, again, they appear in the written sources quite late. So um, we have like Etruscan and Italian and Greek pottery already in the seventh century. You see, we have Daunian pottery, like Daunia, way down in um, Italy, in the south. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, Rome. They're one of the peoples affected by Rome trying to secure its backyard. Um, Rome founds a colony, basically on the entrance to the peninsula, um, called Aquileia. Um, we don't have it as a settlement, of course, because Rome founds it in in the second century BC. And it's a really provocative move. And yeah. um, we, we have to guess that the Romans know that because. Um, <laughs> They they just found a colony there, and um, even the sources are like, huh, the Romans just couldn't really decide should should it be a Latin colony or should it be a Roman colony. They decided that they make it a Latin colony, and then they plant it there. And the historians really get angry because like the Romans just settle on their border, <laughs> yeah, maybe even partly in their land, and um, they then just just invade Histria and have a few campaigns there and um, it's um, they fight a few battles um, the historians conquer uh, an almost abandoned camp of the Romans and I think they even get a hold of the commander <laughs> um, it's it's a bit it's a bit wild the the conquest of Histria um, then they have a king who is drunk and um, and the Romans come back with with like an entire legion. Um, so they put they put effort in the conquest of history. They um, dedicate an entire consular legion um, with a standard strength of like two Roman legions and two allied legions during the Republic. Um, and with that, they enter history and conquer it. And um, there's again the stereotype of of Illyrian peoples being drunk. Um, that the because they partied so hard from ca capturing this abandoned camp that um, they all partied into the night and then the Romans attacked them. <laughs> and the oh, um, Ipulo, the historian king, had to be carried off from the table he was lying on and saved from the battlefield. He was then just put on a horse and sent what? away. I think 7,000 historians what? died in this battle, oh my in this God. massacre. And oh, yeah, it's no. it's really wild this this <laughs> this conquest. It's also a, a pretty short affair, I think. So also the Romans take it seriously. Um, but yeah, and um, they don't have um, the the Romans don't hold them in high regards. Um, they are known as a against Enops or poor people, and. Um, yeah, they have their few um, coastal fortresses, and um, they import a lot of wares, but probably 
don't export a lot. Mm. Um, a few of their settlements, those that don't get des destroyed by the Romans, um, the Romans destroy quite a few of their city cities, um, but those that don't get destroyed, they, um, like, uh, Tergeste and Pola become uh, Colonia and a Caesar, and um, a few others become, uh, um, like, Parentium becomes a muni municipium, um, but um, the Romans urbanize more the coastal settlements and the hinterland be stays more rural. Um, so yeah, it's... I, you can feel a bit sorry for them. How yeah. The Romans treat them. I mean, imagine, but, I'm just thinking like, imagine you're, you're celebrating victory, you're like, yeah, let's all have a party and let's all get drunk. We've won a great victory against the Romans. This massive... Uh, um, you know, sort of dominant power <laughs> near us, and then you wake up the next day. They're like, um, king or chief or whatever. Um, how are you doing? Like, oh, that that party was wild, wasn't it? It's like, yeah, our whole army got killed <laughs> while you would oh, while damn. you were passed out on the table. You'd be like, Not oh, <laughs> worst hangover ever. <laughs> oh damn! No, really, yeah. Um. <laughs> God. You just, you can just be sorry for them. Um, Honestly, sometimes yeah, the so. truth is stranger than fiction. Because if that was in a book or something, True. you would just be like, "Nah, that's just stupid." <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we read the sources and we look at them and are like, "Oh no, this, this can't be. This is this is kind of too stupid." But then I, there's always something in my mind that goes, "But maybe it happened." It's, yeah. I mean, ru it's rumors. It's crazy to not be true. Yeah, but, rumors. Um, rumors always have a kernel of truth in the in the beginning of them, don't they? So <laughs> yeah. that is funny. The, the, the drunkenness is like a a really favorite stereotype, as you may have noticed, of the Romans and Greeks for, mm. but not just the Illyrians, but for barbarians in general. Like, yeah, to the Greeks and Romans, there is nothing more bar barbarian than wearing pants and drinking your <laughs> wine unwatered. <laughs> Like just just pure wine or pure beer, this is really barbaric. So so this drunkenness is always an expression of that you can't hold back. You you just have to drink your alcohol pure, and um, yeah. then you just die of the consequences, either in battle or or um, drinking it or <laughs> like just think... drinking it like like Agron. And yeah. so um, <laughs> they they really like to build build into their stories that um, people were drunk. Yeah. Um, I think there's also an episode, I, I forgot why talking about the RDI, but there's also an episode where I guess they, um, the, the Celts fight against them, so, and the Celts notice that they drink so much, then they mix like some stuff into their drinks and um, half of the RDI pass out and the others uh, flee into a river or something and drown because uh, of their stomach aches that they oh, get God. from whatever the, the cats have mixed into their drinks <laughs> because they they kind of just just heard that the Illyrians drink so much so yeah um, really wi really wild anecdotes you get um, yeah. from this area <laughs> no cool it's really interesting anyway it's really interesting um, but yeah before we finish off uh should we have a look at the generic illyrians yeah definitely so uh here we have the generic illyrians guys and they are very similar to the greek city-states or the generic anatolians the generic thracians they're there to represent some of the other tribes that were part of illyria that obviously didn't make it into the final part of the mod and of course you know there's only a certain amount of factions that can go in each region they can't have an unlimited factions there's a, actually a set number in in terms of the engine unfortunately before you run out of factions so that's why you know there's not a hundred factions in illyria or greece etc so is there any specific regions that you want to uh, focus on yotl yeah um i think very interesting are like the ones you're currently looking at, Abilis and Amancia, um, because they're both among those that are a bit unclear if they're Illyrian or Iperod, um, because they are often counted among the Illyrians, um, yeah. 
but they are they enter the Epirot Koinon, the the Epirot League, in I think 220 BC, and um, Epirus is structured in the so-called Koinon, a, a, a tribal league where the, mm. the many tribes get into bigger alliances and bigger alliances until you have like the big three tribes, the Kaonis, the Pesprotrians and the Molossians. And Bullis and Amancia get into the same system. Um, they also organize their structure like the Epirots. And they're even mentioned among um, uh, Delphic inscriptions. So they're more and more um, treated like Greeks proper. Um, but they're often still perceived as alluring. So they're a very interesting border case. And um, it's probably this area that was fought over by um, um, Mytilos and uh, Alexander, the son of Pyrrhus. Yeah. yeah oh, their cool. cities are very Greek. So you have like theaters and uh, stadiums. Yeah. Uh, and this one has an Odeon. So. Yeah, yeah, right. So um, they're very. Um, to use the term Hellenized, so yeah, um, oh, yeah cool. they're very interesting in my mind. Um, right, I mentioned Tuscana and Duonion, I mentioned the Autariatai. Um, oh, yeah, I could say a few words about um, Orson and Pleraiopolis and maybe Segestica. So, yeah. um, the Orson is also one of the most Hellenized Illyrian cities, especially really? in this northern area. Cool. Yeah, they have a lot of um, Greek imports, and also a lot of Greek structure in their in their settlement. Um, it was probably initially built more on a hill and kind of settled down towards a valley over time. Um, it tra- so they traded a lot um, with the Greeks, um, and they might have conquered or taking influence over Narona at some point and use it kind of as a um, as a port city because Narona was was located on a lake which we couldn't represent on the map yeah. and on the Naro River which we couldn't really represent but um, it was also a trading line um, which the the Orsi the Orsi probably made use of um, they also minted their own coinage um, which depicted chips of course <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um, yeah, they were um, trusted allies of the Romans, um, and like I mentioned previously, when the Delmate attacked them, Rome intervened in Illyria. Mm. Um, so I, I think at some point the Romans do get mad at them for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I think they they get part of some rebellion or something and then get punished for it. Yeah. Um, and the city doesn't really survive it in the long term, sadly. Um, they they kind of get unimportant over time, a bit like the Tolentians. Mm. Um, but but they do in the Hellenistic era they do have a, um, a pretty good face, I, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, cool, fantastic. Do you want to uh, say anything yeah. about these guys or? Yeah, um, maybe um, first um, the Broiki and Kib- Kibale. Um, yeah, they're the right ones. I'll toggle the fog wall for this one as well. <laughs> and, yep. um, right, um, the city is, is like um, a minor city um, that is located in this area um, on the tributary of the Sava River. And, um, yeah, the, the, it's more about the Broiki that live there because the Broiki like the Desitiatus are one of the more warlike Pannonian peoples. Um, I think they are also one of the leaders of the um, Great Illyrian Revolt um, and known to be quite ferocious and um, Mm. fearsome. Rome continues to um, recruit their auxiliary cohorts in this area. We have several inscriptions of um, of, on gravestones from Broikian um, soldiers in the Roman army. So, um, yeah, they, they must have been quite um, popular as auxiliaries for the Romans, yeah. and for, probably for their warlike abilities. Um, though we 
Chun always overestimate that, but um, yeah, they're. Um, I mean, they're also represented in Rome Two to rule more, so yeah, I think it's it's a good choice to at least represent them with a um, generic Illyrian faction, even though we don't know a lot about them, sadly. Hmm. Cool. So on to Suggestica. Yeah. The Savia. Um, um, Zagestica is a, an interesting city because it, um, it's on several, um, well, it's surrounded by water, technically, and um, it really benefited a lot from trade, uh, from, from trade, um, yeah, from, from river trade, um, which was really attractive to the Romans. Um, technically, it was a double city. Mm. Um, because there is Zegestica, the, the trading town, or the, the port town, and Siskia, which is a fortress um, quite close by, and um, which could be um, defended really well. So it was really attractive to the Romans, to Augustus, who ended up conquering it. And um, yeah, it really became big under the Romans because they um, used it as a river port for their fleets mm. and um, for their campaigns into, into Dacia and into um, the surrounding area. So, um, yeah, it's also a quite uh, prominent and um, important city. So um, we also represented them with the generic Illyrians. Yeah, I mean, it even makes it into uh, Rome Total War Vanilla. So, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Must uh, must have been obviously was quite important to the Romans, wasn't it? So um, yeah, this is mostly yeah. um, in, in the original Rome Total War. That's mo mostly how the um, city choice goes. Uh, yeah, what was important <laughs> to the Romans later uh, is important for the map. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> um, fantastic. Well, we've covered all the factions then, but I just wanted to ask you a couple of things first. So. Um, before we finish guys and if you have made it this far guys comment down below who you think's got the coolest history out of all these guys and make sure you do like and subscribe of course and share this with anyone else that might be interested in this Illyrian history too which I think is really cool and um, but first things first well like how did you learn all this obviously I know you're a historian but was it mainly primary sources? Was it a mixture of the academic sources that, um, you know, the academic work that's been written on it as well? Um, uh, books, that sort of thing, on, and journal entries? Um, because I'm assuming there's not a huge amount of information out there about these guys. No, there's really not a lot of um, scholarship in the, um, yeah, in, in the English-speaking world, let's say, um, about them, sadly. Um, we worked a lot, of, a lot with primary sources, but you really need um, support of um, literature, which deals with inscriptions and kind of trying to piece together all these source fragments because um, there's a lot of um, things that are kind of inconsistent and uh, disagree with each other, mm. especially on something like the Autariatai and the Adiai where they are located and when they fight mm. whom and where. Um, and scholarship kind of falls into similar traps sometimes. Like I mentioned that the that Monunius um, of the Lyrian Kingdom is um, seen as a Dardanian in um, two quite prominent works, actually, in um, J.J. Wilkes' The Illyrians, which was the basis for a lot of research for us. He also does it, and um, uh, Hammond, who is an expert in Epirus, Illyria, and Macedon, who also kind of argues with very weak argumentation that this is the case. So we even have to go beyond that and look really yeah. deeper into, li into the literature, into the sources, and what do they say. And um, yeah, um, there's a lot of wild anecdotes, like I said. Um, <laughs> with like how um, Illyrian women were perceived and how their drinking was perceived um, and their partying <laughs> but also their, their military capabilities um, which yeah. are of course very important to ancient writers mm. um, so it, it was really a balance act and a quite complicated one 
Yeah, cool. No, fantastic. Um, and I'm assuming quite a lot of archaeology then as well, along with it, uh, has gone into this in terms of, you know, looking at what archaeological sites are most prominent and, you know, especially with the forts, I guess, uh, that you were mentioning before. Uh, and I guess those those sites kind of map out where these factions were in, in at least to a to a crude degree. Um, yeah, and I mean we luckily have some writers who focus on uh, geography like Strabo and um, Sudo Skylax who does like this coastal voyage. Mm. Um, and you can kind of compare them. So what has changed between the fourth century and the first century BC, yeah. which is a long time period. And then you have like these political um, changes that appear on the um, periphery of the sources, like the Demate um, invading um, the Isaian colonies or mm. um, the Illyrians getting involved in Macedonian politics. So this is all the stuff you kind of have to piece together for the geography of the starting date. Yeah. And for the Northern Illyrians, where we basically don't really have written sources for the starting date, um, you really have to go off of archaeology, like we said, with the with Promona and um, the fortresses of yeah. the um, Liburnians, Iapodes and the Demate and kind of have to trust that the archaeologists um, know what they're doing, <laughs> um, which I trust a lot because um, I, I wouldn't know. And um, yeah, it's it, it really came um, together quite nicely to, to um, see how it all balances out each other. Mm. Fantastic. And um, so following that then, so once you've got all this information together, how did you decide on which factions to include? Was it simply these are the most important ones and, the you know, the, at the time, at the start of the campaign uh, or the most impactful ones further down the line? Was it, was it pretty much as straightforward as that? Yeah, it's, of course, um, easier to pick out the most notable ones in a bigger area. So um, mm. with the Istrian Peninsula, you have like one faction on this peninsula, then you have this entire coast strip with the Liburnians. And um, um, we wanted to balance it a bit with like not only representing the coastal peoples because um, we could have made like probably five more factions on the coast because we know way more about them than about the inland Illyrians but of course we also kind of we want to represent um, the Illyrians that are more in the hinterland like the Yapodes yeah. which are very very prominent in the archaeology like we have a lot of material for the Yapodes um, we don't really have a lot for the Desitiatos but they are also um, and they also appear quite late but uh, we don't really have factions there because um, our sources really care about this area only very later on and mm. um, so we kind of have to decide also where to balance it with factions um, where we kind of want to fill the map a bit so there are um, factions expanding against each other and um, so yeah. we don't really have like a very populated coastal strip and then an empty hinterland even though there were probably people who are also politically engaged with one another in this area mm. um, these are things you kind of have to keep in mind with faction selection. Yeah, of course. And like, at the end of the day, it's it's a game and history, not the history, <laughs> history, <laughs> history is fantastic. And the amount of work you guys have done on it and, you know, the, the amount of detail that goes into this is absolutely amazing. Um, but these factions have to be playable and they have to yeah, work on the map and they have to be able to, you know, you know, there shouldn't be, in my opinion, anyway, factions in in really any game that just die every single time on the first turn. Like every single faction needs to have a chance of surviving. Because imagine coming back here, like you're the Romans, you finish off conquesting Italy, and then suddenly, like the first time you've ever seen it, the day city eights have this m empire on here, and you're like, that well, that's cool. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that's uh, that's. Um, that's really cool. Um, and yeah, thank yeah. you for that information as well. And finally, fun question. Not, <laughs> not, a, not an intense question, but a fun question. 
Uh, might be the most controversial one of them all, though. You never know what's going to come up in the comments. <laughs> Which one is your favorite Illyrian faction? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm very biased in this. Um, I'd say the Illyrian Kingdom because um, I really fought for their inclusion. Yeah. Um, because at first we really didn't know that there was a, an Illyrian Kingdom there. And I, I really dug deep into the research and argued on, on like pages to Mausolos and Jorolov to be like, there is definitely a, a kingdom there and a, probably a pretty stable one. I want it there. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so I'm, I'm very glad it made it in and I could convince the other historians um, of it. Um, other than that, um, probably without the bias, I'd say the Dardanians. Um, yeah. I find them very interesting um, in their involvement in like uh, Macedonian and Thracian politics and um, I always wonder myself what they are doing up there um, <laughs> in the mountains. No, yeah, yeah. but um, they're very interesting and um, I've also, beyond the mud, I spent a lot of time trying to get information about them just um, out of interest for myself, so yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Well, yeah, I think obviously we're all biased, aren't we? I, I like, uh, I mean, and they're all really cool, but uh, Dardanians definitely seem like, just in terms of a gameplay perspective, history is re the really, really interesting of them as well. But from a gameplay perspective, you are, you know, surrounded by opportunities or disasters, depending on how you play it. So that's, that just really, really makes me want to play them. So fantastic well um i think that's going to be everything so thank you so much yotl for this it well, thank has you been really really interesting i hope a lot of people out there learn a lot about this culture that is really not explored very much in these uh, games generally um and this time and just not really explored that much um anyway because there's two big cultures nearby that get all the coverage which is obviously the romans and the greeks so um yeah it's really cool to explore another culture uh, along the adriatic sea and 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 really bring them to life i think it's amazing yeah i think so too thank you very much for having me no it was fantastic thank you very much guys and of course everyone out there who's watched this make sure you like and subscribe go check out the mod discord down below you can read all the developer diaries that Yotl has uh, put in there about the histories of these uh, these nations as well. Uh, if you want even more, I mean, we already went through everything, but if you want to go over it again, you can go and check out the developer diaries down there and comment down below which faction you like the history of. Not the history, the history of. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for watching, guys. Thank you, Yotl, once again, and I will see you all again on the next video.